Alright guys, welcome back. Uh, this episode will be another cassette tape episode. Because we got 12 of them. And that's probably going to be about 10 to 15 minute episode right on its own. So, here we go. When Quiet first came here, she demonstrated her marksmanship against that enemy fighter plane. It showed she was much more than your everyday crack shot. Hitting a moving target from 600 meters is a challenge, but it's possible with the right training and equipment. But shooting down that missile, that's a world apart from taking out a soldier on patrol. The chopper and the missile were in motion, meaning different vectors at high velocity in three-dimensional space, and she shot an unguided bullet that had to fight air resistance and gravity. All that while the chopper was taking evasive maneuvers. Some of the best target leading I've ever known. She has a superhuman sense of spatial awareness. You put her in a fighter jet, and she'd be an ace right off the bat. Hell, your judgment was top class, too. Realizing she could take out that pilot? That's quick thinking. You and Quiet could make a hell of a team. You'd be damn near unstoppable. Quiet is still in her cell. Only a few staff are authorized to go near her. She hasn't tried anything funny, but that's what bothers me most. In particular, what does she have to gain by coming to Mother Base? I first thought she was under orders from Cypher to take you out. She didn't manage it in Afghanistan, so round two happens here. So I lighten the guard. And that lock on her door is a joke. You gave her an opening. And? Well, she hasn't killed you yet. And I hate to say it, but she's had plenty of chances. You made me the bait. Poisonous bait. What better? Anyway, she didn't bite. Quiet is keeping her silence. So I'm left with no idea again what she's doing here. We tried communicating with her through writing. That didn't work either. Whether she's illiterate, dyslexic, or just plain stubborn, she won't cooperate. I just don't get it. If she tried to contact the outside, it'd be picked up by our counterintelligence net. But it's clean. There's no sign she's had contact with the staff base facilities, nothing. She's almost got the men wanting her to try something, just to find out what she's up to. And she's in there putting on the failed soldier look, all downcast eyes and defeated sighs. But she doesn't kill herself. She can't be trying to leave Cypher and surrender to us. <laughs> so what's the verdict? This may sound optimistic, but here's how I see it. Quiet came here to fulfill some objective. To kill you, maybe to destroy Diamond Dogs. Whatever it was, before she could do it, something changed her mind. Yes. When I look at her, I sense hesitation. You think she'd betray Cypher? Can't say for sure. I prefer the ones that talk. Anyway, we'll keep her under watch. And we're also looking into those special abilities of hers. You'll be the first to know if something comes up. Why not look in on her yourself once in a while? Right. I actually, actually might do that this episode if uh, if these cassette tapes don't last too long. I want to switch back so I'm catching catching those guys' dialogue up there, and it's a little annoying. Yeah, that, that stuff on my screen. Development there project it is. has been added. It wasn't just Cipher. Back in the Caribbean, every eye in the world was turned on us. A private army, just a bunch of guys with guns, in possession of a nuke? Why wouldn't they be uncomfortable? And that's why you made sure the inspection happened. Well, I thought our best move was to prove to the UN, through the IAEA, that we had no nuke. Of course, I was against us having it in the first place, but that was Snake's decision. The boss wasn't responsible. Well, don't get me wrong, I, I still believed in Snake. I thought I was making the best decision for all of us, that's all. I figured we should get a third party to exonerate us before proof of the nuke did get out. And who better to do that than an organization with international authority? <sighs> so the truth is, you took it upon yourself to agree to an inspection arranged by the UN. Only the inspection was a ruse, and Cypher Strike Force XOF showed up instead. I had no idea that would happen. Enough bullshit. Oh, sure, like I could have known. You know, I was just trying to prove our innocence to the world. What's wrong with that? 
We're not interested in the excuses you've thought up. The truth is objective. Just see it from my point of view. You led XOF to the control tower. They seized it, giving them complete control over the base. Moments later, they detonated C4 on the strut legs. Anyone who'd managed to survive was hunted down by the assault force and their choppers. You can't believe I did that on purpose. That was the end of Mother Base. But it wasn't the end for you. How can you... Look, think about it. I lost something, too. I built Zeke and it got buried underwater. I am a victim. That raises the big questions. Why were you the only one spared? You got away without a scratch. Why did Strangelove leave the base on the eve of the inspection? You two were close. Strangelove? <laughs> and how did you manage to build something that surpasses Zeke in every way? Because you did everything they told you. <laughs> You're the only one who didn't lose a thing. That is the truth. I was taken away against my will. Skullface forced me to do his research these past nine years. He used me. I lost nine years. Nine years? We all lost nine years. It wasn't just you. I suppose blaming me makes you feel better, does it? But who's gonna give me back all the time I lost? You're not getting anything back. <laughs> You're not a victim here, Emmerich. You're the perpetrator. I didn't know anything. Nobody can back that up. Yeah, all the evidence is at the bottom of the ocean. You know the hardest man to break. The type who's fooling himself. That takes time. It's easier to live a convenient lie than a painful truth. Is that the piece you've chosen, Doc? I'm not lying. Of course. Just let me check one or two things. On that day, you were in the control tower with them. Lucky you. That's how you got out unscathed. And you escaped on one of their choppers. Only you, right before the base went under. They had me blindfolded the whole time. I've never been so scared. The whole flight, I thought they'd kill me. But, but thinking of you kept me going. My comrades, all the way. And? There was a plane journey, and then we traveled by road. When they finally took off the blindfold, I was in kind of a warehouse, on the floor. Afghanistan, it was that research lab. I couldn't believe they'd taken me halfway around the world. And soon enough, he came. Skullface. He's the one who's really behind that mother base attack. He forced me into that research. What kind of research? He told me to build a bipedal walking tank for the Soviet Union. Like Peace Walker. A system that could fire an ICBM-class nuclear weapon. That's how the Sahelanthropus project got started. Sahelanthropus. Those AI weapons I'd made in Costa Rica were like toys by comparison. A whole world apart from reptilian four-legged crawling and, and that ridiculous hunched-over bipedal waddling. My design evolved to the dawn of mankind, Sahelanthropus, the first steps towards humanity, an upright bipedal weapon system. Originally, Sahelanthropus was going to be a manned weapons platform. I designed a cockpit in its head, and I planned to fill it with water as a buffering agent. Like how Paz modified Zeke for human control. Don't compare me to some amateur. I designed it for human control from the beginning. The problem was miniaturizing the posture control AI. You remember the reptile pod? The AI that controlled your unmanned weapons. Attaching it externally makes it vulnerable, so this time I wanted it beneath the armor. Meaning I had to make the AI smaller. I got it down to less than a tenth the size without any loss in computation speed. But it was still too big for the cockpit. There wasn't enough room for the pilot. If I made the head bigger, its body would have to be bigger to support it. Uh, too big to be practical. In the end, human piloting was taken off the table. I tested a remote control system too, but there was the time lag and I wasn't satisfied with its precision either. Plus, it would be useless if the enemy jammed it. So 
next, I went back to trying an AI-only system. To do that, I had the AI pods recovered from Nicaragua. <sighs> this was a hybrid AI, a combination of Peace Walker's reptile and mammal pods. The only AIs that had ever successfully operated an unmanned nuclear weapon system. Really? You'd need some help to get that working. Expert help. Did you work with someone? I worked alone. You did that yourself? Well, that's the thing. The AI didn't pan out in the end either. But I did finally get Sahelanthropus walking by folding over its upper body to lower its center of gravity. The first upright bipedal locomotive weapon system in the history of mankind. I guess technically it falls into the anthropoid ape category. I don't see the benefit of having it stand taller. On terrain with significant differences in elevation, like Afghanistan, you need a body that's vertically adaptable. That also lets it attack from long range while using mountain ridges for cover. So, making it walk upright was the most important factor in giving it superior height capability. As the name suggests, that was the whole point of Sahelanthropus. But I was being pushed for results. Having the AI mounted externally would have been the fastest way to get it working. I just needed more data so it could maintain its balance. But Skullface refused to wait. He dismissed the idea of AI control and took Sahelanthropus away from me before I could finish it. But it was walking when it came after you. That's just it. I don't understand how Skullface got it to move upright without a pilot or an AI. And walking at that speed, too. It's beyond anything I could have imagined. This is like the Wright brothers making it to the moon. I I'm just as clueless as you are. So this Soholanthropus, where is it now? I have no idea. All my experiments took place at that cave. I've never seen it anywhere else. Besides, it's still just an incomplete prototype at this point, and nothing but a paper tiger. Even if it can walk, it's far from being a viable weapons platform. It wouldn't be useful in actual battle. Emmerich will remain here at Mother Base for now, but not as a member of Diamond Dogs. I still don't trust him. That work for you? Fine by me. He can't be allowed any contact with staff either. Yeah. A lot of the guys would love some payback for nine years ago. We still need him alive. But we have to restrict his movements. He can only go where we tell him. And of course, the interrogations will continue. He worked for that skull bastard for nearly a decade. He still has more to tell us. How long are we gonna press him? If our investigation shows he really had nothing to do with the attack, we'll reconsider his place here. But I don't expect that to happen. Remember that water tank-shaped object in Emmerich's lab in the Soviet base camp? The thing that started talking to you like a possessed answering machine. That was a pod belt for housing the AI used to control unmanned weapons. You remember, back in 74 in Costa Rica. It was in those machines you fought there. They were designated pupa, chrysalis, cocoon, and basilisk. And each of them was fitted with an AI unit called a reptile pod. Emmerich created it. It mainly handled the machine's posture control and autonomous behavior. But the Basilisk, a.k.a. Peace Walker, also featured a second AI pod. That one was called the Mammal Pod, and it was created by Dr. Strangelove. She tried to recreate the boss's personality through the Mammal Pod, but you pulled out its memory boards. That's when it transferred its own functions to its reptile pod. Just like a human brain compensating for damage, by using the remaining healthy parts. The result was a unique entity, a hybrid of the reptile and the mammal. It sank to the bottom of Lake Nicaragua with Peace Walker, but apparently they salvaged it and transported it to that lab. Don't let it deceive you, Snake. It may sound like the boss, but it has neither a personality nor a will. Like Emmerich says, it's just a machine. Ever since the attack on your unit nine years ago, the name Big Boss has become known the world over. What do you mean? Those of your men who survived traveled far and wide. They fought throughout the world. In fact, they're part of the reason we have all these PFs now. 
Every one of them suffered their own phantom pain from losing you. Talking about you wherever they went helped to heal their wounds. Your actions and words, your legend, has been told on every battlefield they've set foot on. Obviously, as the tales have spread, the truth's been distorted, painted over. Big Boss sacrificed himself to show us the threat that Cypher poses. He sounded a warning, so it goes. A warning? Too much power destroys the hands that hold it. Apparently, you chose to be a living example of that. I never said any of that. The moment any truth is passed on, it starts turning into fiction. The problem is, fiction inspires people more than facts. To the world, you're now the legendary mercenary Big Boss. The lessons you've taught the PFs are the reason they're so widespread. They're the reason they've survived. And you know what they all aspire to? To one day go nuclear, just like you did, and stand up to Cypher. Of all the stupid things you could do. They'll never understand what you really wanted. Heroes are misunderstood. It takes a man of the same caliber to understand what drives them. Bottom line is, these guys want to be like their hero, Big Boss. And deep down, they all have their eyes on nuclear weapons. They say that a nuke is the only means of standing against Cypher. But these days, it's becoming little more than a slogan to rally the troops and survive in a cutthroat business. Currently, there are three major PFs who've expanded into Central Africa. CFA, Rogue Coyote, and Zero Risk Security. HEC's investigations have shown there's almost no overlap between their areas of operation. It's not so much a turf war, more like they have a gentleman's agreement. If you do cross paths with them, you probably won't have to face more than one at a time. Still, don't expect a walk in the park. The CFA, Contract Forces of Africa. These guys are a major player. Their head office is in Pretoria, South Africa. That's also where the South African Defense Force is headquartered. We think the two are closely connected. An HEC investigation revealed that most of the CFA's operators are former SADF soldiers. South Africa has been locked in struggles with neighboring regimes for years. That means constant action. And we know better than anyone that's the best kind of training. A company drawing its recruits from hardened military vets. You can bet they know how to handle themselves. Do not underestimate them. Within the CFA is a company of soldiers made up mainly of locally hired operators. They speak Afrikaans to communicate with personnel from the CFA. But if you notice any speaking the local language, that's them. Though hired from the local population, they were originally part of a paramilitary group. So they'll have plenty of combat experience. And unlike their days shooting junkyard rifles out of beat up pickup trucks, the CFA now supplies them with the latest gear from the West. On top of that, they've been combat trained by the South African Army. All that adds up to a much stronger fighting force. So don't brush them off. Look at the Angola Zaire border region. The East Bank of the Muneni River, in particular. It's a microcosm of a problem that stretches all across Africa. There's a civil war going on in Angola fought between the government MPLA and the Western-backed UNITA. Zaire is still a dictatorship under President Mobutu, but numerous uprisings have broken out in its remote regions. With all the trouble elsewhere keeping their hands full, neither government has control over their side of the border. They depend on militias and PFs, as do the rebels. Government forces, guerrillas, militants, Groups of all shapes and sizes hawk whatever resources they can to hire PFs. Conflict brings PFs. PFs expand the war zone, and more conflicts erupt in a continuous chain reaction. <laughs> Sounds like our kind of work. Mother base could grow by leaps and bounds. Alright, so that was all the set types that brings us up to date on what I have unlocked at least so far. Uh, in the next episode we're going to pick up on episode 10, Angels with Broken Wings. See you then. Thanks for watching.